Call this meeting to order. We'll start with the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Here. Yep. Here. 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 Actually, wait a second. What was what was the one I just called out for? I called out for McGee, but I think I just called out for another one too. I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, you're good. Okay, we're good. You just got called twice. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, we had um, confirmation that um, Kaznacki and Sinkowitz are out of town, and Mr. Nagy is ill tonight. I hear a motion to excuse Kaznecki, Sinkowitz, and Nagy. It's moved. Second. Motion Second. Nedro. Second Combo. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, water board. Do we have any water board absentees we need to address? No one comments. Nope. Okay. Um, before we, uh, we go to call to the public, I just want to give everybody kind of an overview of what we're going to do here. We've got a couple presentations to do in terms of what laminar flow aeration is, what we're doing with it, um, where we're going. We're going to open up for questions. We'll definitely take questions from everybody. We'll have an open Q&A session, session afterwards. So um, there may be a lot of questions that you have that might you might find get answered as we go through the presentation. So keep that in mind, but I'm going to make sure everybody gets a chance to ask questions, uh, go forward and do that. Um, Got two announcements, and then I will go to. Actually, no. Let me go to call to the public, and then I'll do my announcements. So, um, I'm going to call to the public. Yes. Oh, and um, we're doing this online, so let's get. The, we've got a portable mic. We'll hand around here. Linda Champagne, 250 Oak Island. Just want to thank Ron Cumbo, Mike Stack, John Scott, and I think Sue Solomon for passing out the flyers to hundreds of homes the other day to get people here and informed about what's going on with the. Uh, Variation in the lakes. Anybody else in the first call to the public? <coughs> okay, seeing that at the moment, I'll close it and believe me, we'll make sure we get all your questions answered before we're done. Um, I do have two quick announcements. Um, this, not actually on aeration, but also on the, on the issue of wa water quality. We've had a couple of uh, presentations and discussions over the last couple of years on fracking and a resident passed along. The movie Gasland Part Two is playing September uh, 30th, Tuesday, over at the Commerce Township Library at 5.30 p.m. There's a couple little flyers over there, so um, I wanted to let folks know about that. That's about um, the issue of fracking, some of the things that have gone on with it. It's not a pro-fracking movie. Um, the second item I had was a letter we got from um, President Pro Tem Ed Sinkowitz, who is out of town today, but he did want to send along a note um, regarding lake matters, and I just wanted to read it to everybody now. To all present, generally the lake weeds seem to be less of a problem than past years. Possibly last winter and weather in general helped us on our war against aquatic weeds. Surface weeds like wild celery and lily pads have been ever increasing the last few years. These surface weeds are ideal for harvesting. Instead of our current practice, I feel that lakefront access and beaches need to be aggressively maintained by harvesting more frequently, thus being proactive. Residents should have total use and access to these beaches year-round. Paul, John, and I surveyed the lake in late August, and the lake was covered with wild celery. I believe it all went to seed before it could be harvested. I think a visual evaluation of the lake weeds by the administrator routinely would be valuable in coordinating additional harvesting when needed. Uh, respectfully submitted, Edward Sinkowitz, Council President Pro Tem. So, um, you did want to chime in with that. <coughs> <coughs> All right. Um, those were my two announcements. And now I think we're ready to proceed to laminar flow aeration presentations and discussion. Um, 
purpose of the meeting is really to talk about what we're doing, what we hope it will do, how we're going to measure it. And I think I'll hand this over to Cliff Yance at this point, the Water Board Chair. Okay, well, I just wanted to give people an idea of some of the background that the Water Board's done for, you know, to get to the point we're at today. And I got on the Water Board about six years ago, and the second meeting I was on, I said, why aren't we aerating the deep holes in the, in the lake? Uh, the next morning I called the MDEQ and they talked, got to the right person, which took a while, but uh, talked to the person and they said I was a fool. And, uh, and I think they said it a little more strongly than that. And you don't aerate lakes. And so, uh, you know, we kind of let the issue go and about three, four years ago, uh, John Scott kind of brought up the issue again, you know, why, why aren't we aerating the lake? And uh, we've spent hundreds of hours, uh, probably in the four to 600 hour kind of time frame with our time uh, as individuals to do our research on, you know, aeration and uh, the benefits and, you know, maybe the disadvantages and, and things like that. And so uh, John did a really good job of uh, finding contractors that were uh, available to give us presentations. We had them come in and give presentations similar to what we may see tonight about the technology and everything. And it just made us more uh, aware of the technology, but more adamant that we thought it was uh, a thing that we'd want to test in our, in our lake. And so uh, we eventually, you know, decided to uh, put out an RFP. We got the RFP, you know, a year ago and we um, selected uh, uh, the pond guy to put in our system ultimately. And uh, so the system's in. John, did you want to say anything since you had so many hours put into this? <laughs> yeah, there weren't good billable hours. Uh, <laughs> but that's what we do here. Um, I, I think the what we're going to see here tonight will uh, probably uh, give you some assurance of why we spent all of those hours. I once thought about it at the very early stages, having had salt water and freshwater aquariums. It seemed they worked better with oxygen going through them. As we came into this, and as you'll learn tonight, the driver of the aeration isn't necessarily putting oxygen in the water. It's really allowing the water to turn over, the bottom areas to come to the top, the top more oxygen to go to the bottom. I don't want to take away anything other than thanks to everybody on the water board for working so hard to get this to where it is and i think you'll find out this is a very very uh advantageous thing we hope to do for our lakes it's in 17 other lakes right now in the state and it's under deq observation so right back in uh 2008 when i had called the deq there was zero in lakes uh, there was ponds they weren't they didn't have a permitting process or anything like that and so that's why the guy kind of said I was a fool so but now they've ch changed their mind and one thing I'm hoping is that with uh, our community and others as we put in these systems and hopefully we see good results that uh, we'll get to a point where the permitting uh, uh, process is streamlined for for these a little more than it was and and we'll get into that because uh, a pond guy is going to talk to that issue so uh, so DEQ is getting on board on, on this and, and getting educated themselves. And that's all what we're about, was being educated on this and implementing something we thought was going to be beneficial to the lake. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to the pond guy. To so, guys. so everybody, a couple, couple folks that will be presenting during this meeting. Um, oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Paul Hausler from Progressive AE. Um, he's our lake consultant. And uh, he'll be talking. And this is Dave Haddis from Pond Guy. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, aeration and what's what's going on. So, Paul, I think the floor and the microphone are yours. Dave. Dave. Oh, okay. Sorry, Dave. Yes. Dave. I know that. <laughs> okay, I'm Dave Haddis, uh, the service manager at the Pond Guy. Okay. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, but. Uh, what eight nine months ago, we were uh, contacted by Wolverine Lake to, uh, uh, you know, uh, get some quotes on an aeration system uh, for the lake for the Penny Penny Lake arm of the lake, and uh, we did a presentation, and uh, they, they decided to hire us to install the system. Uh, I just have uh, a few slides here to kind of show you what we did, uh, what we're planning on doing, uh, to try to help everybody better understand 
you know, what's going on with it. So let me just run through this real quick and just, just kind of an update as to, as to what we've done. So uh, we started out with the, uh, the permitting process once we had a signed contract. And uh, uh, back in February, we did a, uh, a pre-application meeting with the DEQ. Uh, that was just to kind of uh, uh, get them to familiarize their, themselves with the, with the project uh, that we're requesting. Um, after the application meeting, we submitted the permit on 228, and uh, took a, a little while to to go through the process. Um, we, uh, you know, everyone we was patient. About that a little bit later in the meeting, right? Everyone was patient, uh, and uh, finally on on 57, uh, the DEQ sent out a 30-day public notice, which I'm sure uh, most or everyone have should have received. Uh, and uh, finally, on uh, 722, we received a an approved permit to go ahead and install the system. So, uh, three days later, we were out here. We uh, on 725, we began the installation, and uh, on uh, 729, the first system was operational. Uh, we have uh, four units total, uh, with uh, 24 diffusers in the water that appear just like this. Uh, Weighted, weighted tubing that's running from the diffuser uh, up to the shoreline, which ultimately lands at the compressors, which are in different locations on the shore. And uh, so uh, we did a stagger start on the systems just to kind of uh, help get the fish used to the, the water changes uh, slowly. So it, it took about a month to get all four systems uh, up and running. And uh, you know, at this time, everything is, is, is fully operational. Just an overview of the install. This is uh, some of the airline that we used in the cabinets, kind of just being delivered. And uh, the uh, we chose to put the power locations uh, up near the street uh, for quite a few reasons. Uh, number one was the uh, most accessible power, uh, and uh, keep everything close to the street. That way, when everybody's down by the lake trying to enjoy themselves, so they don't hear the compressor uh, down there. So uh, there are remote manifolds down by the water. Uh, that uh, they house valves uh, so we can adjust the diffusers as needed. That's what the, the irrigation box is down by the water there. Uh, from the uh, uh, cabinet, compressor cabinet, uh, down to the water, uh, we just uh, we trenched in an uh, inch and a half direct barrel airline, and uh, that, that's what uh, transfers the air from the compressor uh, to the manifolds down by the water. So. They're buried uh, approximately eight to ten inches underground. Uh, these are the compressor cabinets that are that are setting up on Wolverine Drive. They're all on uh, on Wolverine Drive. Uh, two of them are at the uh, boat launch at 350 Wolverine Drive. Uh, the next step was uh, placing the airline and diffusers. Uh, it was uh, quite a bit of airline, about 18,000 feet. Just shows uh, the process of uh, unrolling the tubing and and setting in, in, in into the water. So, and then we had the three or four finished systems in three different locations. Now, uh, f from the original uh, proposal uh, for the diffuser locations, uh, we, we had the, some of the diffusers in, in deeper water. And the DEQ uh, had requested uh, or mandated that we, we move some of the diffusers from the deepest parts of the lake um, and uh, put them in a little shallower water. So uh, these are the, uh, all the diffusers are located by GPS uh, so that anytime we can go out and find a diffuser w where it's supposed to be. And uh, that, that seems to be working pretty, pretty well to keep track of everything. So. And uh, these are the GPS coordinates for the plates and the depths. Um, obviously, a lot of them are in the shallower part of the Penny Lake arm, which is towards the south. Then, as you get uh, towards the north, uh, you know, we, we put them in the deepest areas that we could, uh, that the DEQ would allow us to. So those are your uh, your four units and their locations. Uh, it, it's to do with the thermocline and the and, and, and the uh, the fish 
the habitat. Go ahead, Justin. Yeah, they're concerned about cool water refuge. Yes. Yes. Right. Uh, it, once we get the, the, the proper data collected and uh, we, we find out that, uh, or prove to them, I guess, that uh, there, there's, there's no harm with this system, uh, we're, we're hoping that they'll, uh, you know, allow us to get the plates in a little deeper water here. So, uh, but that, you know. I'm sorry? Uh, no, actually, Paul uh, from... He'll go over that in a, in a little bit. He's, they're actually monitoring quite a bit on the lake here for you guys. So, But uh, uh, since then, we've been out just about once a week to just do uh, uh, checkups. And uh, we're doing a little bit of testing of our own and uh, monitoring and uh, checking the air output, just making sure they're, all the units are operating properly and everything's been, been A-OK -okay so far. Um, so basically, that's where we're at. Hey, that does seem like a good a good point to give out. Just a little uh, let everybody know if you do see something that looks like it's wrong with one of the aerators, it's it's moved, it's off, it's you know uh, something comes up, whatever it might be, call the village office and let us know. And uh, these guys yes. have been really good and really responsive about getting out here fast to, to fix anything that's awry. Yeah, you'll see. Uh, uh, you know, if you're out on the lake, uh, all the diffusers should be, uh, I guess, fairly close to one another as far as the pattern they're they're just coming out of the water. And uh, if you see one just bubbling really, really hard, um, maybe even shooting up in the air, then there might be a problem. I haven't seen that yet, but uh, uh, they're all, we, we try to balance them all out so they're all giving off uh, the, the same amount of, of air is what we try to do. All right. All right. That's, um, before we go too much into, into, into questions for Dave, I think probably what we want to do is come back to Paul, let him give his presentation. Then we'll we'll let both of them, both of them take questions because you sure. know, hopefully hopefully we'll cover a lot of a lot of the issues that'll come up. So, Paul, you're up. <clears throat> Thank you. Appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, the process has already been discussed. I will go a little bit into the actual permit and the the verbiage or the the requirements from the, the actual permit on what what our involvement in is basically conducting the water quality monitoring um, as required by the permit but also to determine or to give the board the water board and the council you know a, an idea of what is going on in the lake and what effect the aeration is having on the lake so that's the main role we're playing in this um, part of the project but just to give you an idea I'm just going to read directly from the permit but um, they require uh, samples taken three times during the season um, and the samples shall be taken during the May 15th June 15th period which this year was already too late by the time of permit so we took the the July 1st through 15th which is the second period and then we just collected the September first through 15th so we'll be doing that same process next year what they did allow originally they were not going to allow the um, system be installed this year because they were going to say that this first year of collection was going to be the baseline and they needed baseline data before they would allow the installation of the aeration system so what we did is we gave them data that we had from previous years it wasn't all the parameters that they wanted, but it was sufficient enough that they were comfortable with that data. So that did help us this year to at least get the system installed this year, although it was late. <laughs> and so we did collect, um, I'm just going to follow down to the parameters, water temperature, conductivity, pH, d DO, dissolved oxygen, collected every two feet originally. We got them to change it to five feet because two feet was a little crazy. Um, and then we had basically three sites, two of them are control, um, the deep holes out into the main part of the lake and then the one aeration, there's a 40 foot hole in the aeration part of the lake or the penny arm and that's where we're taking the, the aeration samples. Also water column, total phosphorus, orthophosphorus and total suspended solids 
should be taken at surface, mid-depth, and bottom. We did, we did that twice this year. Chlorophyll A should be collected from the surface at a, as a depth integrated sample. Algae phytoplankton community composition as determined through microscopy, including the relative proportion of percent blue-green algae, green algae, and silic silicaceous diatoms. That's a mouthful. Listed species and their distribution in lake. They're talking about plants now, or macrophytes. Density and cumulative cover of native and non-native plant species, including the AVAS survey. We did that prior last year, and we're doing it again this year. The distribution and abundance of starry stonework measured annually in response to aeration as requested by Aquatic Nuisance Control Unit of DEQ. And then they require that a report be submitted with all this information prior to December 31, 2015. So once we have all the data and we compile it, we will have a report that will also obviously give to the board and to the DEQ. Um, so just to kind of, not used to holding a microphone, so I apologize. Um, the handout that I gave you, or some of you have at least, I apologize, I obviously didn't make enough copies. Um, and if you didn't get a copy, some of this information is available on our website, which is at the top. It's www.michiganlakeinfo.com, just some of the general water quality information. But just kind of to give you an overview of lake water quality and what we're measuring, basically lakes are classified into three categories based on the enrichment or the amount of nutrients that have in, you have in a lake which support not only plant growth but also fish growth and any kind of organisms that are in the lake. Um, so basically what it is is Wolverine Lake is considered a eutrophic lake so it's kind of the, the third one down on the list there and it does support abundant plant growth and fish growth as well. Uh, let me see and then it talks about the different parameters and how they apply but I'm not going to go into that in great detail but what I did want to emphasize there's three basic parameters when you're talking about um, classifying lakes and those parameters are the clarity of the water which is measured with a secchi disc and it's called secchi transparency um, some of you might be familiar with that a lot a lot of um, lakes do their own secchi transparency measurements i think are you doing that cliff or we've done it in the past <laughs> okay <laughs> so um we're relying on your data <laughs> so if you look at that chart on the bottom are the dates that we collected um the secchi transparencies and um the red line shows when the startup of the aeration system began which is basically the beginning of august is when it was up and running and basically what I wanted to emphasize was that um, if you look at the previous year's treatment from 2013, and we take samples in the spring during um, what's called spring turnover when the lake um, is, has a uniform temperature from surface to bottom right after the ice off typically. And then we take it again later in the summer once the lake is stratified meaning that the warmer water is at the surface and the cooler water is in the deeper part and the chemicals in the water do not mix so it separates the two parts of the lake and that's what they were alluding to the thermocline and they're talking about not you know, not allowing them to put the diffusers below the thermocline so the long and short of it is that basically the information that we collect on all three of these parameters Total phosphorus is another one, that's another chart. Um, phosphorus is the nutrient which is important in aquatic systems because it's generally called the limiting nutrient. It is the nutrient that determines how much plant growth or how much algae growth you will have in a lake. Um, nitrates, there's plenty of nitrates and nitrogen out there so plants can always get nitrogen but they can only get a finite amount of phosphorus. So it's a very critical element that we sample. Um, and the only thing, yeah, like I said, what we're finding basically is that right now the system has only been in for a month, basically operational. We're not really seeing any difference 
yet, and we didn't really expect to see any difference because it's only been in for a month. So I guess from a standpoint of it's not causing any damage, that's good, but um, we'll have to wait probably till next year and we'll have more data, a whole season's worth of data, and the system will have been in for a season, and we'll be able to get a lot more information on whether um, you know, it's having any effect on the plant growth, the algae growth in the lake. The other thing that the board was interested in was sediment depth, if, the, if it's causing a decrease in the organics and the sediment. And so we'll be measuring that at the end of the, we have, uh, if you go to the last page of that handout, we um, pass the, yes, on the very back, there's a map of the lake. Oh yeah, it is on there. So basically, there's a company called Navico Biobase, which we have a, a subscription through when we have a depth finder that um, allows us to collect a lot of data while we're out there. And um, part of that data is the sediment thickness. Um, it measures that um, across the lake. And we also can create depth contours with that. And that's what we did with this, the data that we collected. Because the original map didn't show that deep hole down in the very end of Penny Arm. It just showed it as shallow. So obviously, there is a deep hole there, if you guys have ever been down there. <coughs> Um, the other thing is uh, by measuring the sediment um, depth before the system was installed and then we'll be doing it again at the end of next season after it had been in for a complete season, we'll be able to see if there is any effect on the sediment depth or the organic layer in the sediment to see if it is reducing that layer. That was one of the main goals of the aeration system installation. So. That's basically what's being done. Um, it's kind of complex, but it's also fairly simple. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. I've presented kind of a lot of stuff here. Okay. First, uh, is it going to run all winter? No. It's on, um, I think the shutdown is November. Is it? What is it? November 30th. Is November 30th. So, yeah, it, it's not run over the ice. And part of that is because of the hazard of having open spots <laughs> on the ice. So. I no, I haven't personally collected data. There is data out there from other lakes that the, the DEQ has. It's public information. We are going to be looking at that also. I uh, I really can't answer that. <laughs> I mean, for them, but I think in certain aspects it is. Um, so it, it's probably on an individual lake basis. So, hey, Paul, Paul, before we open up to, to too many too many questions here. Um, I've got kind of one one question for you. Then we'll go to questions for the board and the council, and then we'll open it back up. Oh, to okay. Sorry, to every, I, every, I, every, well, I jumped the gun there. We sorry. also have the future, kind of the future, and you're we'd like you, uh, Paul, to give kind of an overview of the management of the lake while we're here, even though it's okay. an yep. aeration. It, exactly what I was going to ask is if you could give us a few minutes to tell everyone. You know, this is one of the things we're doing on the lake. What are some of the other things that we're doing and how does this fit? There is one okay. other thing that I think we should bring up also. A lot of people aren't familiar with aeration, what it's about, what it's going to achieve and what we're trying to achieve. It might be a good idea to give a brief overview of the whole process and why we're doing it and okay. what our goals are in doing it. I don't Perhaps know if I'm the best person to do that. Or, but or somebody, I somebody think. Can, yeah. Yeah, we can do it from the water. Perhaps, Perhaps we should ask. Who Paul is and what his role is. I don't think that was actually addressed. That might be helpful too. Okay. Well, I, yeah. My name is Paul Hausler. I'm an aquatic biologist with a company called Progressive AE, and we're basically hired by the council and the board to uh, oversee the aquatic plant control program on the lake and to also conduct water quality sampling and do some of the educational aspects of the program, the lake, the the ecological part of the, the lake. So, 
that's that's my role, I guess. <laughs> okay, so let's 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 do it in this order. Let's go back up here, and I'll go to Cliff, actually uh, Cliff and John, to talk a little bit about aeration. Okay. Why we thought it was a good idea. Why we why we decided to proceed with it. Then I'll come back to Paul. Ask okay. Paul to talk a little bit about what we're doing overall on the lake. Some of the other things that we do on the lake, and then we'll go to questions up here. Then we'll go to questions out there. So. Well, maybe the, we can really, I can summate it in, in a way that I was thinking about it when I first got involved, and I know when Cliff and I were talking about it. Um, I think there are three words that maybe pull it together. Clarity. How do you increase the clarity of a lake? Because a lake has suspended items in it. It could be algae, it could be suspended uh, materials that are in the lake. I, I'm certainly, uh, Paul can address that. So clarity is an issue that we are looking to address. Uh, another issue that we are looking to address was nutrient loads. In other words, when Paul was telling about the type of lake that we are on, or has been created that we live on, and do remember it's a created lake. It's impounded, there's a dam, so most of our lake was uplands, grasses, and other farm levels of uh, land that was flooded. And when you flood the land like that, which includes the topsoils and the nutrients, you bring it into the lake, and that causes a lake to basically have higher nutrient loads than lakes that are fed by streams or fed by rivers, and they have a constant moving uh, of water moving through it. An example of that would be, I suppose, the connector between Lake St. Clair, the St. Clair River, and Lake Erie. Uh, we cannot really spawn walleye. We can't do things that those lakes can do because our water doesn't turn over as much. So between clarity and nutrient load, an item that is important, and that's what I think I just talked about, was turnover. How many times does our lake have the ability to be fed and refed with um, uh, lower nutrient loads or getting rid of those nutrient loads and turning over. I, Paul, the, the number that I think I'm correct on is that our lake, if you took a, a, a pint of water, and I, this is going to be a terrible example, I'm not a scientist, but if you took a pint of water and ask yourself how often do you change that water, how often is it turning over into a fresher load of water, I think right now our lake is something in what is it, every 65 days? Somewhere around 60 days. If this aeration system works and works properly, we might expect to see our lake turn over every two days? Yeah, uh, one and a half times. Every one and a half. So, so we're moving the lake just by bubbling it. And remember, we're trying to create movement of water. Yeah, if you, if you look at... If you look at this, yeah. the idea of the bubbles isn't, the, the amount of air that we're getting into the system from the compressors is minuscule compared to the amount of oxygen we're getting into the system by creating this laminar flow. So the bubbles, they cause, they're, they're you know small bubbles, they cause all this friction that helps move the water that is you know around those bubbles to the surface and then you get this flow that goes like this and that is the that's the laminar uh, laminar means it's non-turbulent and so you have this non-turbulent flow of water and what that does is at the top of the lake it's oxygenated be naturally because of the atmosphere you know the and the uh, the oxygen exchange with the atmosphere and then you're drawing that water down into the lower levels of the lake and drawing up the the less oxygenated water at the bottom and so the whole idea with a with a laminar flow uh, aeration system is to get that circulation going and so that turnover that John's talking about and that they've designed in the system is that it was designed for we're hoping for like one turnover uh, uh, basically a day and uh, and so then you're like John's saying is you're getting you're getting all that oxygen and circulation in the water. It's not like it's not like you know you'll see a current or anything really, but it is this slow process uh, which we've really sped up and actually with one turnover per day. And 
it's just bringing this oxygenated water up. It's the, the non-oxygenated water comes to the surface, gets oxygenated, and keeps circulating in, in that manner. And I, I guess basically then the third item is sediment. Um, so clarity, uh, nutrient loads, and what's at the bottom of the lake? Now, I don't know if anybody has ever jumped in maybe six feet off the shoreline. Um, if you're not six feet tall, that might be the last time you'll jump in. But, but basically, that is the, I guess, the best example of talking about what sediment is all about. And remember, we're an impounded lake. We have a dam. So what was not water, in the water is now in the water. And over time, we have added to that sediment load by doing harvesting, which is a good thing. I shouldn't say not adding to it. We've actually, with harvesting, we reduced the amount of load that's in the water. But by using chemicals, we're killing plants and they're staying in the water. Now, that isn't all that bad if in a normal lake system you have enough oxygen and other items to, no different than a compost pile, take that vegetation and turn it into something less uh, detrimental to the lake than what's happened in our lake. Right, so basically the, the process uh, is that oxygen cons you know, breaks down the, the muck, in the, the, muck, the sediment, exactly. the muck in the bottom of the lake. And uh, it's no different than when you put a match to a, a stack of leaves and you're, you know, in the fall, if you do that, which you're not supposed to, but uh, don't. In, in, I'm not condoning that, but I'm just saying, if you threw matches on leaves, they burn, right? So they consume, and what they do in that process, I think everybody pretty much knows this, they consume oxygen and they make carbon dioxide, you know, and, and they burn, they, they, they burn up. The same process is what we're hoping happens to the sediment that's in our lake is that if you have enough oxygen in a lake or a pond, that that same process happens on a much much slower process than when you, you know, burn burn leaves or whatever. But we also the leaf litter. We get a lot of leaf litter in our lake. So whether you're not supposed to blow your leaves or put your put your grass in the lake, but it but it happens naturally, even if no one does it artificially, because you know, the wind blows and we can't catch every leaf that does. So we have o over the last, you know, 60 years of this lake being around, and actually more than that probably. 80 years. 80 now. years, we've accumulated all this mass. And what happens is during the summer, the, the uh, below the thermocline, you get this thermocline, so you have this uh, warmer water at the, at the surface and you have colder water in the deeper zones. And the, uh, the water doesn't exchange between the two very much. What happens in the deeper zones is they go what we call anoxic, low oxygen or no oxygen. And under the no oxygen thing, the muck doesn't, doesn't get burned up, if you will, with oxygen in the lake. And so the, the point with the aeration system and one of our goals is to get oxygen into the lower, uh, you know, into in deeper and so that there's enough oxygen to consume the, the leaf litter and the mass of, of muck that's in, that's in our lake. And so we should see muck reduction as we get oxygen. One of the main goals of putting this system was to see a four milligrams per liter, uh, you know, <coughs> like constant level of do dissolved oxygen in our water column. Typically what we would get is maybe the first eight to 10 feet you'll have you know, you'll start off like a normal level for oxygen, fully oxygenated water to have what, 10 milligrams? I mean, you can get a little higher than uh, that, but. It depends on, the, it's all tied to the temperature of the water, but in the middle of the summer when the water is say 75 to 80 degrees, the highest you're gonna get is around eight to nine. Right, yeah. right, and in the winter, you actually, actually colder water can accept more and dissolve more oxygen into it. So in the winter, the lake actually gets oxygenated naturally by, uh, the turnover that occurs, uh, we get one in the fall and you get one in the spring, and that, that helps oxygenate a little bit, and then just that colder water does absorb more oxygen. But the idea is to get more oxygen there, get a, get a more uniform profile. If you looked at our profile, you would have, uh, you know, eight, maybe eight milligrams per liter near the surface, the first two, three feet, and then it slowly just decreases down 
and uh, goes to zero or near zero, like less than one milligram per liter, at around uh, maybe eight to ten to. It's to, usually to, by towards the end of the summer, it's usually around eighteen to twenty. Okay, that's even deeper than I was thinking. But the, the bottom line is in the deep holes, there's no oxygen, basically. And the fish can't live in no oxygen. They need about four, three species. Yeah, well, it depends on, again, on the species and stuff. The, the DEQ standard is five parts per million. Right. Um, if it's below that, it's considered. Right. And so bigger fish can go into the deep holes, and because they have bigger body mass enough, they don't suffocate. Because that's what they do if there's no oxygen. The fish suffocate, just like you would if you didn't have oxygen. And so uh, they can go down there and they can spend a little bit of time, and different species can spend more different time. But uh, the idea was to get more oxygen in the lake. It, it helps this muck reduction, because it'll naturally burn up the, the uh, carbon that's in, in the water. Uh, or in the sediment. And then also we wanted a kind of more evenly distributed oxygen profile so we didn't have this, you know, high oxygen here and if this is low oxygen, you know, kind of profile with depth if you thought depth on kind of on a chart, you would you would see a profile that looks something like that, you know. And we want to see more of a profile that that slow more slowly kind of dies off and and gives the fish more area and more depth that they can uh, survive in for longer periods of time and it provides the oxygen that consumes the muck. So we're, those are the kind of things we're hoping. The other thing is under anoxic conditions, low oxygen conditions, uh, the sediment that has a lot of phosphorus stored up, a plant leaf litter has around one and a half percent phosphorus levels, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, your body has about that much. That's what living organisms have about that much phosphorus level, one and a half percent. That's, that's, uh, that's w over 10,000 uh, milligrams per liter of, uh, of phosphorus. It's a lot of phosphorus compared to the levels we get in our lake, which are in the 20 to 30 to maybe 60 uh, you know, milligrams, uh, or no, parts, parts per, per billion. Part, parts per billion. So that's a thousand times less. Um, so you, you have a lot of resource there. Well, under anoxic conditions, the low oxygen conditions, phosphorus is uh, released by the the uh, anaerobic bacteria, the non the non oxygen liking bacteria. They actually release phosphorus into the water column. Then that becomes available for algae and. Uh, the aquatic uh, the aquatic plants and um, and then like Paul said that's the rate limiting factor on the plant growth they have plenty of nitrate and there's nothing we can do about the nitrate level in some respects but it's the phosphorus that controls how much plant mass and algae mass you, you get in some respects and so the under oxygenated conditions phosphorus precipitates as phosphate right Okay, as phosphate. So, um, so instead of having all summer long, if this system works, having phosphorus released to spur on uh, algae growth and plant growth, you hope that you're fixing what they call fixing, which means precipitating out of the water the phosphorus, so that it's not then available for the uh, the the algae and then any plant that isn't deep rooting. Uh, because deep rooting plants will still be able to get the phosphorus that's in the actual sediment. But we're looking, we have starry stonewort, a lot of starry stonewort. It's this stuff that causes the mats uh, that I'm sure most people that have ever been on the lake have seen these dense mats of stuff. Well, that's actually a macroalgae that gets its uh, phosphorus from the water column. And what we're hoping is if we take that phosphorus away, we can. We, we hope we'll see a reduction in the uh, starry stonewort in particular. And uh, so that's some of the, some of the things we were looking stuff. for was, a, was a, a more even distribution of, uh, of oxygen in the lake, which helps, in our opinion, helps the fish and, and the aquatic uh, situation. It should help with the uh, degradation or the breakdown of the sediment, the muck, and we hope to see muck reduction. Now the pond guys in their proposal, 
I think we had put in something like 10% muck reduction a year or something like that, and they came back and said, we can't guarantee that. If you have 20 foot of muck, we're not, we're not gonna guarantee we're gonna get two feet. I think you guys came back six inches, I thought. Something like that, something on that order. But there should be muck reduction every year that this system operates. And you know that gives us more water uh, that's usable in our column and just helps, helps the uh, the stage and our whole purpose of doing this is we're a euphoric or eutrophic sorry we're euphoric too yeah <laughs> we're we're an uh, eutrophic lake which means that you know we have high amounts of muck and sediment you know this this uh, organic material we have we have some algae we have you know a high level plant what we're having to, we're hoping to do with this system is see that kind of creep back uh, back to the good side of Kind of the uh, uh, stages of a lake uh, towards, you know, the uh, the mesotrophic would be the next uh, phase, and that's where you have more of a balance. And we're not sure we'd ever get to uh, the what is it, Ili oligotrophic, oligotrophic, <laughs> which is like this big, big, beautiful, pristine that you can see 40 feet through and whatever. You know, I mean, um, but we're trying to move the kind of nature back to balance, more balance, if you will, with the system. We're kind of you know, hoping to reverse the clock a bit on it. Yeah. Exactly. And to keep the clock from moving it mm -hmm. quickly forward. So uh, let me go to a couple couple things, then I'll go to Paul, then we'll go to questions from up here for both Dave and Paul, and then questions from out there. Uh, just a couple couple things that have, that have come up. Uh, questions that gets asked a lot is, you know, so are there other lakes using it? Have they had success? Over the past few years, and some of you out there um, have certainly been in some of the meetings, some of the hearings that we had, there have been other lakes, especially out in Western Michigan, that have used these systems and generally seen some, some pretty good success with it in terms of muck reduction, in terms of phosphorus reduction. Um, but, you know, it's not a guarantee. It's generally pretty good results very early days for a lot for the technology in a lot of places you know they're kind of working through it uh, but it definitely seemed quite promising for us uh, one of the reasons we were surprised the DEQ process took so long is because the DEQ over on the other side of the state has been permitting these systems for a while and it was really just working with with the regions um, I should say that both our state rep uh, Clint Kesto and our state senator Mike Kowal were very helpful in getting us in communication with the head of the DEQ. <laughs> we had a meeting here with uh, all of us, Dave, me, uh, those guys, the head of the DEQ, to work through some of the permitting permitting processes. So we were we were lucky to be the pioneers in Southeast Michigan for this. But I know some other lakes are looking at it, and there are a lot of other lakes looking at us to see what what our results are. Uh, second question came up a lot as we worked through it. So we've put in the aeration. Are the pl you know are we never going to have a, pl a weed problem again? And that's that's not really the way these things work. They're, it's a long term it's a long term system. It's a long term work. One of the things we could see is if we reduce some of the free floating algae, we may actually get some additional weed growth from that from just having more sunlight in the lake. So we're going to monitor this. We're going to go forward. We're going to see how it is. Um, it's going to take time, and it's also part of a lot of other things that we do in the lake um, to try to address the weeds, to try to address the fishery, to try, try to address the recreational opportunities, keeping it clear. And that seems like an excellent segue to hand that back to Paul to talk in a little more detail about what we do. Thanks again. Yeah, I, just a couple iterations to on the discussion that you had, Cliff. I just wanted to you had every you had about 90 percent right <laughs> but, but it, it's not actually the oxygen that that destroys the organic it's the bacteria that are in the sediment um there's two kinds of bacteria basically there's anaerobic which are bacteria that can survive without oxygen they're very inefficient at com at composting basically and then there's aerobic bacteria which are much more efficient so that's the goal of that program is to get more of the aerobic bacteria which are going to, you know, quote unquote, consume or digest those, the sediment quicker than the anaerobic. And then I think you had, there was something else too, but <laughs> it's, it's fine now. So anyway, well, just to give you an idea, you know, what we do as far as the plant control on the lake, we go out several times during the season to survey 
the entire lake in what's called the littoral zone, which is basically the area of the lake that has rooted plant growth and can support rooted plant growth. And basically on Wolverine Lake, it's a large part of the lake. It's probably about 80% of the lake can support rooted plant growth because it is an impoundment, as John mentioned too, it is very fertile sediment that can grow good aquatic plants. So the difficulty is managing those plants to try to get the good, quote unquote, good plants in there. You, you're, the goal of this program is not to eliminate all plants from the lake because if you tried to do that, for one thing, the DEQ is not gonna let you do it. And the other thing is, you're gonna create a situation that's not sustainable. You're gonna have wild, crazy algae blooms all the time and the water's gonna be very turbid. Nobody's gonna wanna swim in it anyway. So you're better off managing the system to try to make it more sustainable. So that's kind of the, what the program is. We do that through these surveys that we do. We determine the areas of the lake that contain primarily plants that can cause problems, quote unquote, bad plants, which are primarily invasive, exotic plants that aren't native to Michigan. A lot of them aren't even native to the United States. They come over here through either ballast water, some of them come through the aquarium industry. So they've come over in various ways, but we've got a lot of, you have about four or five species right now on the lake that are not native to the United States or they're not native to this part of the United States. So that's the primary goal of the aquatic plant control is to control those type of plants. The secondary goal is to where you have extreme growth of native plants that's causing problems for recreation or even for the fishery if it's bad enough. So that's what we're doing um, primarily through, like I said, through those surveys, we identify the areas. I don't know if everybody got one of these. I don't think everybody did, but basically it has an example of these maps. And what these maps are based on is GPS coordinates. The whole shoreline is georeferenced, so every one of those point numbers there corresponds to a GPS point. So when we go out in the field, we have a GPS unit that shows us where we are on the lake in relation to those points. And we can create a map that we send to the contractor, either the applicator, which in this case is AquaWeed Control, and or I give a map to Sharon, and she passes that on to the harvesting operators so they can go out and harvest the areas that need harvesting. So basically, all these little notes on there are different types of herbicides or algicides that are that the applicator is directed to use in those areas. So when they go out, they have the same GPS, GPS coordinates. So when they go out on their boat, they have the same points, they're seeing basically the same thing we are. It, it makes for a lot easier um, control and management. And then when we, go, we do surveys after they do the treatment to determine if they in fact did what they were supposed to do and you know, manage those plants where they were supposed to. And if they didn't, um, the contracts are all performance based. So they have to come out there and rectify that situation or they won't get paid. So um, again, we do about five or six surveys a year over the season. So um, we also, obviously also the, the village has a mechanical harvester, which I won't go into. <laughs> all the, the drama with that, but it, it is operational this year. It's running. <laughs> and um, we were able, to, or the, the harvesters were able to provide a lot of uh, relief to areas of the lake where harvesting was more beneficial than herbicides. And a little bit to what John alluded to also about, you know, when you treat plants, they die and then they go to the bottom. Well. That is true, but it also is true that if you time it right and you treat them when they're early in their growth stage, you can get a lot more biomass or there'll be a lot less biomass produced by that plant. If you were just to let that plant grow throughout the season, it would grow to an apex and then die. So you get you know, 80% more biomass if you were to let that plant grow all season long. So there is a benefit to treating in that respect. However, the mechanical harvesting does remove biomass, so it slows that aging process that all lakes go through. 
and that's part of you know what we're talking about too is the natural aging of a lake when you compare a lake that was created by the glaciers um, carved basically with ice in general those lakes are fairly deep um, they don't have as much organic sediment as a lake like Wolverine Lake um, they uh, will last a lot longer before they get to the, the stage that you're at right now so that is greatly accelerated in man-made lakes so we're trying to quote unquote reverse or slow down that process so that's what the whole purpose of this whole program is and what and what we're explaining tonight is aeration is one component of it but it's not the only component Paul can you tell people why we don't just harvest everything yeah well I mean the, the <laughs> <laughs> it, it alludes kind of what to what I talked about before you don't want to remove all the plants from the lake plants provide a lot of beneficial um, factors to lakes they they keep the sediment in place um, if you were to take out all the plants, sediment would just be stirred up all over the place and the lake would be very turbid um, and you get a lot of algae growth from all the suspended sediment which has nutrients in it and so it's, it's a never ending process if you get to that point. So what we're doing basically with the harvester is just getting the areas where there's navigational issues. It's not so much um, we're going out and if there's any plant growth anyway we're going to take it out because all plant growth is bad plant growth. Obviously, the lake is a primary fish fishing lake also. Um, we want to support the fishing in the lake, and a big part of fishing is providing habitat. Um, the, a lot of the plants provide the basis of, food, of growth in the lake or the primary production in the lake. They um, are places where the aquatic insects live on those plants. Um, the, the more diversity you have in the plants in the lake, the shapes and the sizes of the leaves, that type of thing, the more diverse um, of the mac or macro invertebrates or the insects on those plants and the more diverse your fishery is going to, the healthier your fishery is going to be. So we're trying to promote more diversity in the lake, which is much more sustainable than just trying to have, if you were again to go in and try to take everything out, you would open the door for these invasives to take over even worse than they are. So it's always a balancing act. You're trying to create a sustainable, ecological sound environment on the lake. So and I think, I think Cliff was also referring to the fact that some species, especially Eurasian milfoil, which we've yeah. had a problem with over time, they spread through fragmentation. So uh, boat propellers going through them, harvesters going through them, things that break them up into little pieces what you don't get is a dead Eurasian milfoil plant. What you actually get are 100 new Eurasian milfoil plants. So, so um, it's important to pick and choose the places where we harvest and what species we harvest. And, and Paul provides, as he alluded to, a, a map uh, similar to these. These are treatment maps, but he also uh, supplies those, as he said, yeah, to a couple more Sharon to here. share with the, uh, the harvester guys. We also bought a GPS unit that is very similar. It's the probably the upgrade of, of the one he has on his boat, so he's jealous of us. So, uh, But he can share his file directly and it goes right into our machine and then our harvesting people know where they should harvest and uh, the opposite of that is they don't go where they're not supposed to harvest so that they don't spread Eurasian milfoil. And uh, so it's a, it's a, you know, the, the system is uh, an entire Kind of package, if you will, of, of lake management. It's not just one, right. one, one thing or not another. Yeah. I was just saying, if I make a comment, well, another thing your water board did over the last two and a half years or so, with great help from the uh, office upstairs, and particularly Tabitha, we've established uh, a site, an enhanced site, so you can actually go to WolverineLake.com and then go into the water board and you will find a number of different graphs and other items that we've been putting up on that particular site. But on that site we also have um, given you access to identification charts so you actually know what kind of weeds are in the lake or what kind of plants. Let me make it... Uh, <laughs> don't be so judgmental. Don't, don't, don't be so judgmental. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so, um, uh, we would appreciate it if you do get a chance to go in there. We always like feedback at the water board. 
in terms of uh, how well the site is serving your needs. Uh, uh, temperature inversion and other charts are there. Uh, when we uh, open the dam, when we close the dam, and etc. So there's a lot of information that the water board keeps putting up there for you guys. You know, a comment I'd like to make about Paul is uh, Paul is uh, negative. And I would say he, he, you know, if you got the middle, the <laughs> middle is guy. Well, he has a healthy skepticism is what we like to say. Right. So if, if you've got the middle of the road, people that are for for aeration, whether they like it, the water board at times has been a little euphoric about it. And of course, these guys here, they're selling it. They're way over here. And, you know, of course, it's the best, best thing to mama's apple pie, you know. Paul is actually kind of on the negative uh, skeptical side of of it and we actually appreciate that I try to keep an open mind <laughs> I know. so we actually appreciate that because there's other consultants that you know we could have working for us right now that might have been you know on this side so we like that I actually like that Paul is a little skeptical he's like show me prove me scientifically he's a scientist he's a limnologist so uh, you know aquatic biologist so he he's like prove it to me so actually I just wanted to bring that out because you know, uh, he's our kind of conscience, if you will, on is this thing really working? He's collecting the data, so we're hoping to prove him uh, uh, to, to <coughs> get rid of some of his skepticism and move him towards, you know, kind of more neutral, if you will, or, or, or maybe positive. And uh, I just want to bring that out because I think there's <laughs> balance in that as well, that the water board isn't just going off uh, wildly, you know, to wild abandon, you know, whatever, and and uh, hopefully not. We're not wasting your your money, uh, either well, your tax money. money. Is this? So, Let's talk so about how much money it is? So that 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 is a good question from the crowd, and we'll we'll get to all the questions. Just to let everybody know, the I forget the exact final amount of the project, but it came in around fifty thousand dollars for the installation, which is a a pilot project that we expect to last at least five years. So that's. That's the cost of it. To put it in in comparison with some of the other costs, we generally spend somewhere around fifty thousand dollars a year in in chemical treatments on the lake. So we're hoping that we may over time be able to reduce some of those. Um, the cost of the new harvester was quite a bit. It was about one hundred ninety thousand. The old one lasted twenty eight years. We're very optimistic the new, the new one is going to last twenty five or thirty years. So those expenses get spread over time. But the other lake treatment programs that we have are also fairly expensive. I mean, dealing with a large lake, a 250-acre lake, is, a, is an expensive proposition, and that's why we're trying to make sure that we, when we spend money, where we spend money, it's very directed, and we try to get the best bang for our buck out of that. Okay, I'm going to go to, to, to at this future. point, yep, two minutes. You guys get two minutes. I promise a lot of people, they get to ask questions. So two minutes on where some of the future expansion might be. And then I'll open it up here for some brief questions, and then we'll go out to the crowd for questions. So this was a pilot study. The the, the board has th thought of this as a pilot study. Now it's installed, and it, we'll keep it going as long as we seeing good results and whatnot. But if if this if the results come back and we don't see an improvement in the lake or whatnot, then we may turn this system off at some point and not operate it if it's not doing what we had hoped or or whatever. So we've thought of this and as always a pilot study. We originally had uh, in our RFP, we wanted to do a smaller a smaller portion and have a, a true pilot study, a little about half the cost of what we ended up spending the, the approximately fifty thousand dollars. But what happened was people said if you do that you may not see good results. Even Paul was for expanding it to the entire Penny Lake. It's a little bit cut off from the rest of the lake so that it's a it's a very good uh, pilot area. The the next agenda item is future system expansions. If this does what we think it's going to do and it's going to take two to four to maybe up to the five years to find out if this system is doing what we really want it to do and, and Paul will be our judge on that with his testing and, and reporting back to us each year. If it works, the idea is potentially to, ex to expand it into other areas of the lake that have sediment issues. I mean, we have uh, sh very shallow areas in the canals and in the Benstein area in particular that we have a lot of sediment. We know that there's, you know, you know, five, six, you know, maybe more feet of mock. And if the system is 
is breaking that down and, and we just get muck reduction out of this and no other benefit, that may be a benefit for the usability of the lake. And um, so that'll be something we're going to be evaluating over the next few years, but the idea is maybe we would, we would go to the council and, and look for your input as well from the village, whether, you know, spending another 50000 to put another portion of a system in for Wolverine Lake, would that be something that would be advantageous or not, or something that we would want to consider? And so that's kind of our future, future for the lay, for this idea is to potentially expand it. Yeah, and I think it's safe to say that we need to see a success with this before we would go to any other expansion. Exactly. Okay, um, let me go up here to uh, folks from the board, folks from council. A lot of us have sat through a lot of aeration proposals, so we may not have a lot of questions, but uh, we, might have, we might have a couple. And then I'll go out to the audience. So. I'm good. I'm good. Um, I, see, I see one one coming from John. Uh, only because it hasn't been addressed yet, and I'm thinking that maybe the, the public would have a, a question on it too. Are the compressors coming out during the winter time or not? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was that was what I was just getting at. So the compressors come out, but the the plates the, stay the in. The airline, the airline, and the plates will stay exactly where they're at. There's a quick disconnect on the bottom of the unit, pulls out, and it's winterized. And, and I'd like to point that out is that with our contract, we've now got a five-year operation and maintenance uh, with them as part of their cost, uh, which is fantastic. And so they end up uh, maintaining the system. And one of the services they offer is that they pick these thing, units up, take them back, store them in the winter, uh, winter you know, winterize them, make sure they're they're going to be operating fine when they're put in. And you know, I applaud applaud these guys for. Uh, you know the the service we're getting from them and will get from. Okay. Anybody else up here? Well, yeah, Dave. Go ahead, Dave. John. Please. Please, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, there was a comment or a question that uh, I should say maybe a comment that was made by Cliff to me about these other lakes. Uh, I've, I've visited three other lakes um, that are using the system. And, you know, it's very tough to go on a lake and make a determination just on a one-day tour if they are seeing success. Um, uh, however, I've got to say that in one of those tours there were six boats and there were 40 people from the community that had offered to take us out and uh, run through uh, that lake. And, um, and they, were, they were very positive. Now, they have over 260 acres under aeration. I think Maple Lake, if I'm not mistaken, has just expanded to 800 acres, if I'm not mistaken. We have to also put it, and I want to reinforce what's been said here over and over again, uh, this is just a tool. It's one of the tools that we're using. And some of these lakes that have used aeration have seen increased plant growth uh, along its shores. Um, and they're more native plants because they're more deeply rooted, as I understand it. But uh, it's very important to understand that we have this equipment. The equipment is paid for. It's in the lake. It's a matter of turning the switch on and switch off. Uh, and uh, we have, I think, in Paul, probably one of the best people, even though I don't think you're a skeptic, Paul. Uh, <laughs> I've been out with him two or three times uh, to, to see how successful this is going to be. So we're very how, excited about it. And how many lakes? that you know of have aeration in Michigan right now? Well, I heard that there are, we're going to be up to 18. I understand there are 13 or 14 operating lakes. I think the oldest lake might be Maple up north, and I think that is running on its fourth year. Um, and that is all supported by um, uh, Adelarium taxation or SAD, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, districts where the uh, uh, the o the owners on the lake are paying for this installation, and they use harvesting. They had two harvesters; they're down to one um, uh, for for a lot of different decisions. Uh, some of it's just operating costs and etc. Uh, they certainly have their own linologist up there, and they certainly are using uh, all of the tools that we're using. So they see success in some areas. Other areas, it's not reaching the levels of expectations that they had but that's we're three and a half years into it up there so I think we might be even longer than five years who knows but let's 
we're here doing it, and I think it's going to be pretty exciting to see what it's going to turn out to be like. We shall see. Uh, let me go to Dave. Yes. A question? <clears throat> My question is actually for Dave, pond guy. On these compressors, there is a metered 120 volt receptacle, and that receptacle is easily accessible. In addition to that, there is a breaker right next to it, all mounted in one module there. That's also easily accessible. Can that be, in addition to the manifold system at the lake, can any of that be tamper resistant or tamper proof? Uh, yes, I mean, the, the, the cabinets right now and the manifolds are tamper resistant. Uh, the, the systems are actually 230 volt also. Uh, they're not 110. Uh, so yes, uh, they can all be locked if it becomes a problem. Uh, you know, uh, we can lock the panels, we can lock the uh, uh, the plug covers if we need to. But uh, uh, the systems are you know, the cabinets are locked at, at this point. As of yesterday, I had somebody with freshly painted fingernails able to open them up with no instruction from me. <laughs> I'm making that up. So you don't paint your fingers off. So, not often. <laughs> we get we yeah, we can lock the panels. I actually have the locks in my truck. We can lock the panels and uh and, and the outlets also. Perfect. I wanted to make a comment too, is that the the cost, you know, you asked uh the, about the cost. And so it's it was about fifty thousand dollars to put this in. Uh and to pay uh Paul for some of his testing this year and um, there'll be the ongoing uh, testing costs, uh, which Paul, any idea, a couple thousand, three thousand? Yeah. Although most of that testing is testing we conduct anyways yeah, through the course of the year. Going up. I don't know. I got okay, but there, there's a cost for the testing, but it's it's pretty minor. Uh, you know, maybe maybe a couple thousand dollars. I don't know. Maybe so that's more than it is. The annual cost is also the biggest annual cost is the electricity, which they calculated at about fifteen hundred dollars a year, wasn't it? Yes, uh, it was around fifteen hundred dollars a year, I believe, is what it was for uh, for all the systems to run throughout the uh, seven months. I believe is what it is. Yeah, so you're talking about fifteen hundred dollars for that. The O and M is free for the first five years, so that of course doesn't cover the electricity cost. And then we have the added cost of additional testing that the DEQ required, which, like I said, is a, is a, uh, a few, you know, few thousand dollars. What's that? What is OM? Oh, it means operation and maintenance. Yes. So that's all included. So that that's included for five years. The electricity will be about fifteen hundred dollars a year and then the cost of the additional sampling is is in addition to what we had which uh, you know is going to be two three you know about two thousand dollars three thousand dollars a year so maybe there's a five thousand dollar a year uh, cost to operate this system I, I wanted to bring that up because I thought that might be important to some people I'd like to address the uh, the decision making that council went through at least that uh, late in, in regards to the fiduciary concerns that are I'm inevitable that they're going to come up. I mean, I don't think we decided to spend money on a long shot or something that is a pie in the sky. I mean, this is based in science. I'm a believer in it. I mean, it's it's a test pilot. It's a pilot program. We'll see how it pans out over the five year period. But uh, it's it's money well spent uh, to, uh, uh, in my view, to address a problem that is severe. Probably more severe than Paul or, or Cliff or anyone that really lets on. I mean, in a lot of ways, the, with, with this lack of oxygen in these deep holes, I, I feel like the, the lake is in a slow dying process. So I think this condition had to be addressed. And I think this is a, uh, I, I am a believer in aeration. I think it's going to, I think, I'm, I believe it's going to work. And uh, for the amount of money that we spent, it wasn't just like throwing money at, uh, uh, just hoping that things are going to work out. It was well thought through. It's based in, I think, you know, verifiable science and so on. And uh, uh, I think in the, at the end of the day, at the end of the five-year period, I think we're all going to be pretty pretty pleased. So, not that's going to alleviate all your financial concerns because no one wants to spend money recklessly, especially in, in today's environment. But I don't think uh, council did that. 
Okay, anybody else up here or I will uh, open up the, open up the Q&A. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I will I'll try to work through the crowd sort of front to back. We've got a portable microphone here. Um, when I call on you, just give us your name and address, ask your question, and it can be to Dave, it can be to Paul, it can be to us, and we'll we'll try to do the best we can to address it. So let me look up here in the front row. Yeah, there we've got somebody here. So let's hand the portable mic over there. Uh, St Steve and Judy Gebert, uh, 738 Wolverine Drive. My question is, is, is there been, and this goes to Dave, I guess, has there been any problem in other lakes or even with this one so far, it's got a lot of boats, of anchors pulling these things up and what do you do if an anchor gets a hold of a line inadvertently and lugs it up, uh, it damage? Uh, we have not had uh, any problems in the past, and I, I haven't heard of any problems from anybody else. Uh, if it does happen, uh, re please report it to the to the village. Uh, we'll get out there and, and and you know do what we need to do to take care of it. But uh, I, you know I, I don't see it as being a, a, a major issue. Uh, obviously, you know we all have to be conscious that there that there are these diffusers, which uh, you know are there's 25 of them in the I'm sorry 24 of them. In the lake, and there's a lot of airline there. The, the airline sinks right to the bottom. It's it's probably nestled into the settlement by now, but you know, just be conscious that there are diffusers there. If you see that bubble of water coming up, you know, uh, a little bit of common sense will go a long ways as far as that goes. I'm sorry. Oh yes. Yeah, the, the, the airline uh, it, it all runs from the diffuser to the, the, the west side to, to Wolverine Drive. So um, if, if there's a diffuser, you could, uh, you know, pretty much point west, uh, west, southwest, and, you know, for the most part, you'll, you'll know the locations of the diffusers, so, or the, or the airline. Thank you. Right. Other questions, front row? Let's go to the next row. Uh, Jean Evans, I live on Oak Island, so I'm under the bridge and around where there's quite a bit of sediment. Um, I, my, I guess that maybe it's a stupid question, but can you run these on a solar panel? Uh, th there are solar panel solar panel systems available, but uh, for a, a large lake like this, uh, uh, the, the the cost and the uh, amount of panels that you would need to run them, uh, these systems are very are very efficient. Uh, the, the the amount of, of money that they cost to run, uh, you know, comparably speaking, to what you would invest into a solar system. Uh, it, it definitely would be you know, not worth to do it. We have two, and I have to tell you they work, uh, or they're working, uh, over my neighbor has some, and you know we're really thinking about adding one at our place, and I know the neighbor to the other side is as well. Um, and we were just wondering if we could do this with a solar panel or if we really have to hook it into the electric line as well. Right. The, the electric is definitely going to be uh, your most consistent and, and your best option at this okay. point. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Other folks in the second row? I think we've got uh, a couple down here. Hi. My name is Wes Fogg and Sally Fogg. We live at 2103 Helmsford, just down from Scott. We live on the canal. Um, is there any consideration to dredge these canals? I, I mean, the I, homeowners would probably be willing to go in on it or even, I mean, they did it up on, um, oh, what's the lake up there, the man-made lake just north of us. They did it, my neighbors, Sherwood? some friends lake of mine. Sherwood? Poured, Sherwood did it, Sherwood did it. It ended up being like 2,500 bucks a house. And I went through that canal before they did it and after they did it, and there was a heck of a difference. I, I think it's something we got to look at. When we when we took a look at potential test sites for the aeration, one of the places that um, you know really had consideration was the canals to see if we could. You know, it's a different sort of aeration system. You're really talking about a long a long hose with you know a lot of, a lot of little bit, but the canals really need some sort of help. When we looked at it overall, we thought we were going to get the best the best look at whether or not it worked in our sort of sort of lake and what extent by doing penny lake but yeah i agree it, it's we need to find something to help the canals because the canals year by year are getting worse I, I, they're almost on down they're they're getting there yeah i agree 
So, so, so the answer is no, we don't have a plan to, to dredge them right away, but I think we'd be open to, to looking at it, talking about it, talking about if we do get muck reduction quickly here, maybe that's, that's a way of getting in there. Because most of what's in the canals really is muck. I mean, it's from, from there. And if this is, this is a way of doing it in place that costs less, the, the problem with dredging projects when we've looked at them for, for various things is getting those spoils hauled away and getting them, getting a place to accept them is something that 30 or 40 years ago was pretty straightforward and pretty easy and it's 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 a pretty high environmental hurdle to cross in this state these days so it's if, permits yeah it's permits and they pump the stuff on shore into those bags and they haul them away it, it but it's expensive well, i'm telling you i know friends that live on shore where they did it and it wasn't that expensive it was uh, like 2500 bucks a home and i've talked to my neighbors and everybody would be willing to spend 2500 bucks to you know what? I think we should find out what Lake Sherwood did, and, and yeah, if it's if it's less so than I had heard when I mean it, it's been probably eight or ten years since I looked at dredging options, they were all at the time represented as fairly fairly expensive. I think that might be yeah, money well spent. To pay for it, but the people what about yeah. a special assessment district? Yeah, no, that's, I think that's what he's talking about. As a, as a special well, no, I mean I think that's yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely the mechanism to do it, and we could we could we could easily do that if folks want to do it. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Contact his friends and have them contact us. Yeah. And we'll have Come on back to the water board and yeah. and uh, let's you know take a look at it. Yeah. yeah, John, I know some I know some companies that do that do that work. Um, oh, name and address. Russ Collins, eight three six Wolverine Drive. W how deep is our thermocline? Because I'm wondering if we had to put all these things above the thermocline, how effective is it actually going to be to deal with the muck in the deep holes? So so let me go to. To Paul first, and the oxygen, that, and then, yeah. uh, then maybe Dave. So, um, Do I need to grab a mic? Yeah, I think we need a mic for you. Everybody in the room can hear you, but everybody online might look at it later. Paul, you can stand at that mic if you want. Any questions. Oh, okay. Basically, uh, when we were out in September taking samples, the thermocline was around 18 to 20 feet. Um, and I'd say that's pretty standard. For a typical summer um, earlier in the season say July it may be around 12 feet to 15 feet and it, it goes down as you get the warmer days and they push the thermocline down lower so what, what was the question specifically or how, how deep is the thermocline and if the DEQ required us to stay at or above it are we actually doing anything effective with the thermocline or below the thermocline well, based yeah, we well based on again I the, with the caveat that the system was only in place for probably less than a month before it was it wasn't fully operational for even a month when we took the samples. Um, it did not um, mix the water below the thermocline, but with the diffuser set at 18 feet, you probably wouldn't expect that anyway. Um, it probably would be, we'll know more at the end of next season once we've gone through a whole season because basically when they put it in, the thermocline was set. I mean, it was there already. If they go in in April or early May and put it in, the thermocline is not set yet. So it may mix the water enough to keep it from setting up or, it, you know, it could do any, it could push it further deeper we don't really know what it's going to do um i i would suggest that the previous data from last year too is probably what they used to set that that parameter of 18 feet so and, uh, dave anything to add to that Yeah, I guess the only thing I would want to add to that is uh, uh, you're talking about you know the thermocline and trying to have the plates in deeper water. Yes, that's that is I the ideal. But uh, re remember, you're still uh, any oxygen. You're still uh, helping that aerobic bacteria to eat nutrients. So you know even in the shallower areas, you're still going to have that oxygen. Right, it's still going to be effective. Um, is, it would be our, our take on that. Right. We're hoping to convince the DEQ to allow us to put it deeper. Uh, we're, we were not happy about that provision in the permit at all because the, the purpose is to go in the deep holes uh, so that you get that whole column. And to go back to their point of, well, we're worried about 
you know, the messing with the thermal decline and the temperatures in the lake. I don't know if we have great data, but I know when we were getting presentations for these systems, they had talked about a two degree difference uh, prior prior to uh, um, doing the aeration, and then after doing the aeration, there was a two degree difference. So it did warm up the the bottom of the lake, but not enough to affect the species that we have in our lake, kind of thing. If that's what we would get. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with a, a lake that had trout or something that are very sensitive to cold water or something, we have all warm water uh, fish, not cold water fish, basically. Is that not yep. pretty accurate? And uh, that we're hoping to convince the DEQ that they, they have erred on the conservative side and need to allow us to, to put the diffusers deeper eventually. Still talking about that. We're still, we're still, we're still out. Um, anybody else that row? Uh, yeah. Uh, let me move over to the map. Ray Williams, 2352 Ventura Drive. Um, okay, from, from what I think I've learned here, you got 24 of those in Penny Lake, correct? And how, what is the diameter of this? area that's impacted by one of those diffusers? It, it all depends on the depth. Uh, the deeper the water, the, you know, the wider of an area that it's going to uh, circulate. Uh, you know, in some of the shallower areas, that's why the diffusers are, you'll see are a lot closer together in the shallower areas uh, because uh, obviously, like I said, the deeper that they are in the water, uh, the more of an area that they will uh, turn over. Okay, so they're, they're fixed. These aren't something you're going to move around throughout the season. Unless the DEQ lets us put them in deeper water, no. Okay, all right. Um, we were out on the lake today, and you might want to check. The bubbles are coming up really funny. <laughs> <laughs> right there. <laughs> I mean, all of the... Is that Near the buoy? Right? All of the diffusers are really nice. Like a million bubbles. There's one there. There's not, there's not a million, there's, but the bubbles are way bigger than the other ones where they're really small. <laughs> sure. Right about, right about we'll, there. We'll, we'll, we'll check into that in our, in our weekly, weekly checkup. I appreciate that okay. information. No, uh, and that's exactly the sort of thing that you yes. should let the village yeah. know so that they take Well, we went by, we were saying, boy, that, that one don't look right. <laughs> <laughs> I also think it's uh, important for me to come up with a better so, Ooh. One more quick question. So we bought this stuff, right? We're not leasing it. <laughs> we bought it. That's correct. We looked into okay. leasing and the leasing. The, uh, these guys didn't really have a leasing program and weren't that interested in doing one as far as I understood. And one of the other consultants wanted to do one, but I think uh, one of the bids we got a, a preliminary was uh, probably triple the cost, uh, you know, leasing it. And it was a 12-year deal, so it locked us in for 12 years. And in the end, it would have been like double, triple the cost. So it, the, we did a balancing act of, you know, spending the least amount of money, getting the biggest bang for our buck. And, you know, I mean, we're very conscious of not wasting the taxpayers, as we are all taxpayers in this village as well, money. So we, we, did, we did look in kind of contemplate that idea. As I recall, too, the depth regarding the, the deeper, the more effective the diffusers are. I think that was one of the reasons that we didn't go with the, as I remember, the canals as, as a potential pilot area because it was difficult because there's too many diffusers. They're, they're, they're so shallow and they really need a different, a different sort of system. Right. It's been very limited where it's been tried. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And again, back to your question, the system, the whole, you know, this is idealistic, obviously, yeah. drawings and things, and the whole, you know, thing that I do with my hands. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they, they, their system was scientifically based, uh, the, the placement of those diffusers and the depth, you know, depth. Now, the DEQ didn't mess with it a little bit because they would have been in deeper holes, but the system was designed to get that one turnover per day of water in Penny, in the whole Penny Lake arm. And so the system was designed to do that. So it may be a little less effective since some of the diffusers aren't quite in the deepest holes. We may be getting a little less than, than optimal turnover. But even at that, going from 60 to 65 days uh, of, to get one turnover, 
we're getting, uh, you know, even if we're getting one every two days instead of one every day, we're, we're getting a, a heck of a lot of turnover. So there was some si there's science all backed up in, into uh, these, you know, these very uh, idealized drawings, if you will. So, but that was the, the fact. So, believe it or not, those little bit of bubbles in the depths that they're at or whatnot are actually having an effect that, that hopefully will get, you know, like I said, turnovers at least once every two days, if not more. So, can I add something? I just remembered what I was going to tell you before. <laughs> the, the reason they're when the. Cliff alluded to the that they're basically just mixing the water. It's not injecting air into the water, um, and that's why they're called diffusers. What happens is when the when the water moves and it comes to the surface, diffusion occurs between the atmosphere and the water. That's why they're called diffusers. It's not that they're not injecting air in there. It's it's diffusion. So actually, the air is the vehicle to get the right. get the water to, it's to a, move. It's, it's a, kind of like yep. a big paddle. Right. Yep. Yep. It's just moving the water. Yep. Absolutely. And there's my idealized. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I saw the microphone move along. There we go. Martin Hiscox, two one zero one Shanking Drive. Question for Paul: Can you explain these three charts with regards to mean control and what are the yes. units of measure? Yes, the um, the control is basically we have two sites in deep holes that are outside of Penny Arm. So we're collecting data on the same parameters as we are in the Penny Arm, the deep hole out there. Those are, in those bar charts, the one set of data is the mean or average of those two sites. So that's why it's called the mean control. Um, as far as the units, uh, for SECI transparency, it's feet. So that's the depth that you can see the SECI disk in the water at that given time. And then the total phosphorus is in micrograms per liter, which is equivalent to parts per billion. That's what Cliff was alluding to, the 30 to 60 parts per billion is the kind of the average phosphorus level for Wolverine Lake. Um, and then the chlorophyll, is a rough measure of the amount of algae growth in your, in your lake at that time. It's taken at a depth. It's a composite sample with a special composite sa sampler that you take it over. Uh, it's taken in slowly over a depth of twice the Secchi transparency. So if you had a Secchi transparency of eight feet, you would take that sample from 16 feet to the surface and then it, what it is, it's just a measure of the amount of chlorophyll, which is a pigment. So they, they do a, a UV or a spectrophotometer on it to cut down the wavelength for the chlorophyll, and that's how they determine that. It's just a rough estimate, basically, of the amount of algae growth at that time. And, and for those who don't know, when we talk about Secchi transparency, a uh, Secchi disk is a little disk. It's about this big. It's divided into four corners, two black, two white, and you really just drop it on a line and you watch from the boat and you watch to see when you can't see it anymore. And that's that's your Secchi transparency distance. Um, it's, real, it's you know really primitive, but it's a really good effective measure and very consistent in how, how good the transparency is in the lake. And that's a really good indicator for a lot of things in terms of how much growth you have in there, how much suspended stuff you have in there. So. Um, let me let me go let me let me follow the microphone along. The microphone's been moving. There we go. Um, my name's Tushar Ami, and I'm at 352 Wolverine Drive. Um, just I, and I don't know if you covered this already, but how do you know um, if there's enough of these diffusers in the lake? Is there a calculation that determined there, the exact yep, number? There of is them? a calculation. I'll go to Dave to answer that one. When the system was designed, uh, there, there, there's there's a formula that we have. Uh, we actually have an app for it that, that uh, will uh, will tell us the, the depth of diffusers, uh, the volume, the volume of gallons of water that they're moving, and uh, you know based on the depth that they're in. So it's all calculated out as you uh, put together the design for the system. Donna had a question down there. 
So carry right through the internet. Hi, Donna Bothell, 807 Laguna. Just a quick question. Um, how is this different from just the action that you would get from boat motors on the lake, steering up the water? Yeah, I guess I can take that. <laughs> uh, yeah, basically with the laminar flow, you're getting more of a constant flow, whereas with the turbulence caused by a propeller, it's just a short-term thing. You actually, it's more comparable to if you had a really windy day, that's when you would see more circulation and that's based on the amount of water that that wind travels over it's called the fetch which depending on the direction of the wind in the case of Wolverine Lake if you look at the juxtaposition of the lake to the you know prevailing winds which are southwest you get pretty good circulation out in that main body of the lake if you have a windy day but penny arm obviously doesn't unless you're to get a southeast wind, that would be when you would get more circulation. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, I think the microphone has made a, a circulation around. Let me see if we've got up. Oh, we've got another one up here. Edward Kale, 2340 Ventura Drive. Uh, has the uh, turning on the old well pump to keep water flowing through the canal been iced? It's not operational. It's not it's up and running yet. No. Were you going to get it running? It. <laughs> <laughs> it. I know we've made progress on it. I'm not sure exactly it's where. It's complete. it's very close to being running. Obviously, we're towards the end of this year, but you know, starting next spring, we should be able to have that up up and running. One of the things that we did as part of the design was to make sure that it brings oxygenated air in, so it's going to you know, it just goes over some riffles and it goes yeah. and it goes in. Y I, I would like to. I would like to bring great hope that that's going to clear out the canals. I, I you know, it might help a little. I don't think it's, it's really not going to hurt. Make a difference. It's not but it's one step to yeah. the canals. Yeah, it, yeah it, it it can't hurt. It can't hurt, and it may help. And and that's been a thing. That's been a uh, you know, it's one of our agenda items. Even is is the uh, well oxygenation, if you will. And yeah. So it's been something we've been discussing for probably up to upwards of two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, something we want to get implemented, and it's just going a little slower. Well, that was, again, that was one of the permit issues, I think, for the DEQ to, to allow us to be able to convert that well over. So. Right. But it's yeah, a good use, it's a good that. use of that well. We, you know, it, this summer I don't think we had a lot of augmentation but because uh, the lake level was naturally uh, up at a us very usable level we do watch the level very closely and uh, but you know the year before uh, last year we we augmented most of the summer i think mm -hmm. and so instead of using the uh, the mallow beach uh, well that's behind mallow beach in the canal behind the beach uh, the idea would be to use helmsford instead uh, and get the flow through the canals. So it, might, it might help to flush a bit, yeah. Yeah, flush it up. So we're hoping that that would help a lot. But honestly, it's not going to be as, as John is pointing out, it's not going to be as effective as if we could get a, a true aeration system in there. And uh, again, we didn't, we, we talked, uh, you know, uh, about potentially putting a system in the canals because they, they probably could have the greatest benefit of, of uh, a muck reduction, if you will. But we didn't want to start there as a pilot, as, as he pointed out, because if it didn't work real well, then people would be negative on, on the whole pilot study, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't, you'd probably be here telling us not to waste money to expand it. We're hoping in the, this system we have good results, and you'll, you know, we'll have the money, and, and you'll allow us to expand the system. Yeah, we, I think we wanted to pose a tough but representative problem, and uh, Penny Lake is certainly a tough problem. But it's pretty representative of some of the some of the problems that we have in other areas of the lake too. Um, other folks with questions? Oh, got one back there. John Kosky, two hundred five nine Newport Court. Uh, I was going to ask about the canal as well, but I have um, one other question. Well, two actually, real quick. One is uh, the information provided today going to be put on the web, or is it already on the web? If it isn't already up, I think we can get it up there. Okay, and then um, <coughs> are you going to display the data in, in graph form? In other words, we'll be able to see the progress from like the data from this year to the next year 
and so forth. So it kind of gives us an idea of what kind of progress is going. Yeah, we, we should be compiling those stats and they should compile, you know, build over time. And we'll get that up on the, up on the website. All right. question was what's the service life of the compressors yeah the, the compressors uh, obviously depending on uh, how well they're taken care of and since we're taking care of them they should be taken care of well right uh, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, you know f five to fifteen years is, is what a, a motor will last uh, you know just depending on how well it's taken care of so uh, low maintenance cost on these on these units what what does a typical um, motor cost if you had to replace it would you say? Uh, w with labor, you're probably talking around eight fifty, eight hundred fifty dollars to replace one compressor. Yeah. So if we had to replace the the, the motors in the four compressor units, it, it's not a huge cost, I guess is what he's saying. If it was a thousand dollars, even that's four thousand dollars. If we had to do that every five years at the low end of the the life of these motors, that's again, it's it's cost. I understand it shoes into the the village's budget, but it's not astronomical. I paid the electric bill and put one in front of my house. Oh. <laughs> 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 um, you can talk Dave will talk to you. Um, it is something that we've talked about. I've talked with with other folks, some of my neighbors too, because um, where I am, we're, we're just outside of the test area. And <coughs> when I saw where we were putting well, I was like, oh man, just move that one over. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think it is, you know, as a village, as a village entity, we're going to wait. We're going to see what the what the results are. But if people are interested in doing it, or we have some neighbors that want to want to put it in an area, um, I'm sure Dave will be uh, will be happy to talk installation and cost with you. They're pretty reasonable in a small area. Um, it, the cost is not that bad. I can pay the dredge machine. Well, if the you know, given the cost that you had there, I think that's that's worth taking another look at too. Well, everything is more, but. But you know that's that that's less than I had heard it would cost. So, um, other questions? Well, with that, first of all, I want to thank um, everybody for showing up today. Um, it you know a lot of people are interested in this. In a lot of people who couldn't make it tonight for one reason or another, been asking me questions about it for both the last couple couple uh, weeks in particular, but also all year long. Um, a lot of interest in this. A lot of visibility, not just in our community, but all around Southeast Michigan. A lot of other lakes are looking at us and saying, "Hey, they're they're trying this. They've done a lot of research in it. We're going to get some results and see." One of the reasons we had the director of the DEQ here to talk about permitting wasn't just to sort out our permit issues that we had as we went through this, because honestly, by the time we got we got him here, that was pretty much cleared up. But to really talk about what they could do to make it available for for other lakes in the future going forward because um, a lot of eyes are on this test um, i think we're pretty optimistic about what it's going to bring and it's you know we will find out so i think with that unless we have anything further i will hear a motion to adjourn i make the motion we adjourn the meeting motion combo second nedro further discussion all in favor, thank you everybody. Thank you WolverineLake.com at home on YouTube. And we are adjourned.